The S&P 500 is approaching five months from its current cycle low. It's up nearly 16% from that low in October of 2022. Overall, we've been in this trading range for just over 10 months, meaning the market has not dropped below critical key support levels of 3,500 points for the S&P. However, these are some of the most difficult and challenging times for investors. It's what's potentially known as a transitional period between bears and bulls. Now, that does get a lot of people offside quite quickly, so maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot here by mentioning it at the beginning of the video. However, I just want to show you some of the data from the other side of the camp, and you make up your own decision throughout the video. I'll let you know my opinion mostly at the end of the video and sometimes throughout, but this is a look at the possibility of this area in the market being a macro low forming before we start to head to new highs for the S&P, potentially for the NASDAQ, for cryptocurrencies, and most importantly, for real estate. If you haven't left yet, make sure you like, subscribe, follow the journey along. This is what we have been looking at since these June lows, looking at a macro bottom formation on the S&P and Bitcoin as well. When there's so much negativity out in the world, especially trying to creep into the news narratives, it is very tough to listen to something else. So I do appreciate your support on the channel. And if you do find it valuable, share it with a friend. It does go a long way to supporting and helping out the channel. First up, I want to have a look at some of the major news uh, items that are coming out this week. You can see the red, the high impact news announcements are these red icons here. This is Friday evening, my time and Friday morning for the US. We're looking at non-farm employment change, basically the jobs that are coming out in the US. We're currently at historic lowest levels of unemployment, basically seen since 1969, sitting around 3.4%. The news will tell us one thing, the market will react a different way, but essentially what we've seen last time was a forecast of 193,000 jobs and that an actual reading was there was 517,000 jobs that came out. Some would argue that this is a bad reading for the market and from the 3rd of February we saw a decline into the current low of the 2nd of March. However, when we look at the broader picture, not just the day-to-day -day analysis, we are definitely seeing higher lows forming in the market. And this one isn't 100% confirmed yet, but we do have the October low here and then the December low as well. We're also seeing higher highs continue to form in the market off the back of data which can be read as negative, but we're just seeing the opposite happen in the actual charts themselves. And if we start to break through 4,200 points, this is really going to start to set things in motion for the macro bull play to come in, where the news essentially flips to talk about things in more of a bullish light rather than a bearish light. That's the subjectivity of how the news is interpreted. The chart, the data, the objectivity is showing higher highs and higher lows. That can't be argued with, which basically means investors are coming in to buy the market up at higher and higher prices every time the market comes back down. With the increasing interest rates, there have been fears around consumers not being able to meet their mortgage obligations. Obviously, the interest rates have increased quite dramatically, quite quickly. But when we look at the longer term data here, 99% of outstanding mortgages have interest rates below PMMS. American homeowners can get longer mortgages, unlike what we have here in Australia, one, three, five years. Whereas the US, you can get up to 30 years in some cases. And in this case, that would mean that they are insulated from any of the Fed rate hikes because they're not going to experience this until their uh, mortgages come due. So although there's a negative sentiment here, around 99% of current mortgages have interest rates below the current market rate, the majority of these won't see any interest rate rise for many decades to come because they had locked in for long term mortgages. Often what follows from the increased interest rates and the hardship from mortgages that are expected to come, even though many of the mortgages are locked in for much longer terms, we start to see that consumers are drawing down on their excess savings. So this starts to spread more fear to the market as well. The main thing to note here is that the excess savings rate is still in the positive. Although it is getting drawn out quite quickly, quickly it's still in the positive and these can turn into the negative yet the market continue to go up this is such a short look at the entire market that it doesn't really bring enough information however 
when we take a look at the personal savings rate, we can see that this is starting to creep up. It has been at some very, very low levels. You can see in June, it was only 2.7% of uh, personal savings. Now it's creeping up to 4.7%. So we're starting to move back into that positive space. So we're starting to move away from that low of 2.7%. And this really doesn't mean anything to the current market conditions. You can see historically this has moved down from 10 to 15 percent all the way down to below 5 percent. And we can see underneath these levels of 5 percent was basically the top of the market. But that lasted for many years. So it's more so a, a shift in how people choose to use their money. Unfortunately, in my belief, we should have more savings than 4.7% in our accounts, but that's my opinion. In terms of the data here, it doesn't necessarily make a low reading here mean that the market should crash just because the everyday consumer has less savings. Consumer loans, credit cards, other revolving plans is also pointed to as being at historic high levels with credit cards being, again, at historic high levels around 19 or 20% per annum. Now, this is going to always run into all-time high territory because money is continuing to get printed. The population continues to increase. Inflation continues to increase. Therefore, these numbers will also increase. And so when this is pointed to as being a negative to the market, basically macro bearishness, we're at the highest levels of debt we have ever seen in history and credit cards are at their highest levels it doesn't mean that the market needs to crash because this is always going to run up just like the stock markets continue to always run up because of inflation. The money printer continues to inflate the market. Yes, it's turned off for the time being, but over the long term, this number will always go up. But rather than reading this as a negative sentiment, it almost seems bullish. You can see the peaks here in late 2002, early 2003, that was the bottom of the dot-com crash. You can see we went sideways, basically sitting around 240 billion, quick, sharp rise. And this was the bull market into 2007, around the peak of the GFC. This continued to run up into the low and then quickly dropped off before a spike. Obviously, the Fed started to print again, more money went into people's accounts, and this continued to rise through the next bull market from bottom of 2009 to the peak of early 2020. It dropped off and started to rise again. So one might say that this is actually the opposite. Once we start to see a rise in consumer loans and credit cards, that leads to another bull market as it has done in history once, as it has done in history twice, as it has or potentially will do in history three times. That of course is after a sharp decline. Yes, we've seen a pause here and a slight decline, a sharp decline, another sharp decline. So I'll leave it up to you. This is the way I'm interpreting this data. I want to hear from you guys in the comments section. Now, this is where things get extremely misleading. Interest rate rises, Fed pivots lead to market collapses. Entirely untrue. Let's take a look at it from the charts and more historic data from the Fed, the Federal Fundings uh, Fund's effective rate. So taking a look at this, we have a Fed pivot 69, 73, 81, 2000, 2007, 2019, 2023. However, it misses multiple times throughout this cycle and other times where the market was already trending down from that point. Case in point, we can see from the 80s, we have a peak here, market trending up, then a collapse in interest rates or effective rate, market went up. Market rates went up again, Fed pivots, market moves up again after, of course, the Black Monday here, which was a very quick 50% dump, and the market started to climb very, very quickly from that point. Again, here is another pivot. Market runs up in interest rates to this peak here in the 90s. Market continues up all the way into that peak, so potentially over five years here. This is a pivot. This is something that could happen now. Remember, we are only at a move up from zero, which is historically extremely low. Yet during this period, which everyone forgets, the market interest rate was heading down, plateauing, down, and then a sharp rise into the end of that cycle before we had the market collapse. Again, market was creeping up and rising in interest rates for years. 
plateauing for a period of time and then the collapse happened from that point. Same thing again, interest rate rising, rising, rising and a plateau. So although the Fed pivoting has looked like we've seen the market collapse from that point, it can be many years before we do get a collapse. The market can actually even turn. So I think it comes down to what the opinion is when it is said that the Fed is pivoting on interest rates. Is it one drop in the interest rate? Is it multiple drops? Is it multiple drops over a long period of time? Is it multiple drops very, very quickly, like in these cases? But what about this case? What about this case? What about some of these other cases through here? That's in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, where the market continued to go up even after very sharp drops and then rises again. That occasion in the late 70s, early 80s was from 17% down to 9%, up again to 19%, down to 14%. So there was a lot of toing and froing within the interest rates. Interest rate rises through the 60s, mid 60s, late 60s and then a drop. Interest rate rises again into the late 60s and then an interest rate drop. Of course, these gray lines are the recessions here, but we had many times where the Fed had pivoted and the market continued to move up from that point without totally collapsing the market until it was time in the cycle for it to collapse. So really what this is telling us is that the interest rates can increase and the market still increase. Interest rates can go down and the market still increase. Interest rates can plateau the market can still increase. Take your pick. If you find value from the content, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And if you feel up for it, share it with a friend. This is the sort of macro stuff that we go through with our premium members for our trading and investment portfolios, looking at how the market could be interpreted in multiple different ways so that we can then make the best case decision for our own investment portfolios. Something else that is also looking like it's quite bullish is new stocks reaching new recent highs. So this is the USHL, US New Highs, New Lows Index. Throughout 2021, we saw a lot of stocks reaching new highs. Throughout 2022, we saw them reaching new lows. Now, in the early part of 2023, we're starting to see a lot of these stocks start to reach new highs again. Now, this typically happens in bull markets because, of course, if stocks are reaching new highs, then the index itself is going to be pushing to higher prices. If it's reaching lower prices on the stocks, of course, it's going to push the index itself to, to lower prices as well. And we saw the most extreme lows throughout uh, 2022 happen around May and then get a little less in June, which was a significant low. Like you could see uh, here, this is June, this is May. And then again, we had that final low here, September and October. So on this reading here, you could see October is uh, September and October is the, the main points where that final low for the stocks have come in. Now we, we start to climb out of these slums into some higher prices. It's not at these levels that we saw in early 2021 or even late 2021 when we got that final peak, but we're starting to creep into that zone again. Now, after all that info, we come back to check the charts. This is the final answer. This is the data that is given to us by the markets because this is where the investors are buying and selling. They're showing us they're buying up at higher and higher prices every time the market falls on the back of some of these bearish news narratives. Now we look at the lows here at dead on 50% of the macro range. You can see the pandemic low, the early 2022 or late 2021 top, the market fell dead on to 50% of that level. That's why the 50% level is so important. Yes, some other analysts will use a 61% and a 38%, but as GAN analysts, we focus a lot on the 50% level as the markets tend to respect this level uh, quite heavily on the macro and the micro. So looking at the micro, you can see the downtrend. Basically the bear market, the market had bounced off the 50% and has now been rejected at the medium 50% right here at 41.55. So basically the 4,200 level is going to be a key level for the S&P to overcome to get back into that more bullish state. So from that rejection at 50%, we've then come back and just ticked a little under this micro 50% level, which brings up a new, even more micro 50% level, looking at the daily here, going up to around 4,060. And we could look at some of these tops here 
and here at around that 4,080, 4,100 level. So we want to see in the short term, dailies, uh, maybe hourlies, how does the S&P react to this particular level here? Is it able to overcome these levels and then build a case to again attempt 4,150 to 4,200? Or is it going to get rejected, come back down to test the previous level of support? This level was in uh, mid to late December here at around 3,800 points. So that's what I can see happening at least in the short term. Pay particular attention to these levels, 4,060 around 4,080, should we overcome that? Then pretty clear evidence here is 4,150 to 4,200. If we can get over those, then of course we're almost in that free ground again, that nice move to the upside, 43s, 45s, and of course that final top there at 48. So it's got a bit of work to do in the short term. Stay tuned to the channel, like and subscribe. Otherwise, I'll see you over in TIA Premium. Thanks again, guys. I'll catch you at the next video. Until then, peace out.